Good evening. How are you all tonight? Good, Father. It is my blessing, my privilege, and honor to introduce to all of you uh, our neighbor, Father Nikolai Myers, who all of you probably have known for much longer than I have, although we were at seminary together. He was at St. Pecan's in Pennsylvania. I was at Holy Cross in Boston. So I believe we probably passed each other at one point or another, but uh, we only met uh, a few months ago. However, he is a graduate of 2008 from St. Pecan's. He was ordained and assigned to our sister neighbor parish of St. John's and has been in your midst visible at least to you for the last four years, right? Close to. Give or take. Yeah. So he has wonderful things to share with us. Please give him a warm welcome and Father, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Tonight, um, I want to share with you a little bit about um, a, a saint of the 20th century. Is anyone familiar with St. Silouan the Athenite? Have you ever heard that name? A couple people here and there? St. Silouan was a, born in the year 1866 with the name of Simeon Ivanovich Antoninov, which that might give away his uh, country of origin, Russia. But he spent much of his life on Mount Athos at the monastery of St. Pantalemon, where he entered in 1892, the monastery there on Mount Athos, and where he stayed until his repose on September 24, 1938. So he lived in the you know, first third of the 20th century, kind of lived through the Industrial Revolution, we saw the effects of it, World War I, and right at the cusp of World War II. He's very significant. <coughs> significant um, to a lot of people, to uh, the, the monks on Mount Athos particularly. Um, but he's also significant to us here in this country, because his disciple, a man named uh, Sophroni, our commandrite Sophroni, took his writings, which um, is kind of a funny story about how he was given the writings of St. Silouan. You know, normally you think of someone um, as a saint and they have you know, a book and they, or the, you know, nowadays it's a computer, but back then some, a pen and some paper and you know, they would write out a treatise, a big document, um, very ordered and uh, outlined and describing their thought about something. Well, St. Silouan was almost illiterate. He could read enough for the services, um, but he wasn't necessarily an educated man. Um, and so his writings came on scraps of paper that were put into like a shopping bag, like a paper bag, several of them maybe, that he then handed to Elder Sophroni and says, here, <laughs> these are for you. This is what God has inspired me to write on these little, these slips of paper. And Elder Sophroni then, after St. Silouan's death, took them and kind of organized them. And he is the one who has made known to us um, St. Silouan through his work. Um, and this is the book that is of, about St. Silouan and his writings. The first half is a, like a biography and the second half is his words, which when you look at it, and I'll pass this around so you can see it, there's some longer passages, maybe a page or two long, but sometimes it's a paragraph or a couple lines of, his, of what he was inspired to write. And it's organized, his writings are just organized by topic. Um, humility, prayer, obedience, the spiritual life, uh, such things like that. And so, what I want to focus on, though, in the writings of St. Siloan is on his understanding of life in the church, of how we live, and in many ways um, connected to what Father Anthony was saying in his homily 
earlier about the cross and that image he gave you. About we have this vertical relationship to God, but we have this horizontal relationship to one another and to other people around us. This describes in many ways the life in the church. Our connection, our ascent to God, but also our life with one another. They're always together. And so, we're going to talk about that. How does St. Silouan understand salvation, the church, life in the church, and to, uh, in a sense, take the most out of it, get the most advantage for yourself? How to do that? So, so St. Silouan writes, The Lord would save all men, and in his goodness he, sums, he summons all the world to salvation. The Lord does not take a man's will away from him, but by his grace urges him towards goodness and draws him to his love. And when the Lord would have mercy on a man, he inspires others with the desire to pray for him and helps them in their prayer. The, Lord, the Lord's desire is that all men be saved, but all men are given free will to desire such salvation or to reject it. Man in his weakness because of sin and death in the world and, and at work in, are at work in him. He has difficulty seeking out salvation even after Christ has come and accomplished it for, him, for us. Therefore the Holy Spirit was sent into the world to draw all men to God by his grace and mercy. And when God desires to pour out grace and show mercy on a particular man, others are inspired by the Holy Spirit to pray for this man, St. Silouan tells us. And God's incor incorporation of the prayers of others in his work, we learn of the character and nature of salvation, that it is found and accomplished not by our own efforts alone but by God's work and the cooperation of our fellow man. St. Silouan describes for us the accomplishment of salvation for the world in general and also how one embraces it personally. Salvation is found communally in the church through the grace of the Holy Spirit. St. Silouan writes, Father Cassian, who was a, a fellow monk, St. Siloan says, Father Cassian used to say that all heretics would perish. I don't know about this. My trust is only in the Orthodox Church, wherein lies the joy of salvation in the humility of Christ. These words of St. Siloan reveal his perspective on salvation. He knows how it is found, where he has trust in obtaining it, and beyond this, he does not pronounce any judgment. He f his focus is on the way that he is sure of by personal experience, that salvation can be acquired by a person. His trust, he states, is only in the Orthodox Church, which he refers to in many places of his writings. He calls it, in, he refers to it as, quote, in, in our Orthodox Church, he says, the Holy Spirit abides. In our Orthodox Church, the grace of the Holy Spirit is found. The love of God is known. In our Orthodox Church, the greatness of God's mercy is revealed. God dwells in the sacraments of our Orthodox Church. God's glory is seen. Life in the Holy Spirit is lived. In our Orthodox Church, bishops and priests are given to us by the Holy Spirit. And all things are established by the Holy Spirit in our Orthodox Church. This is, these, many places he writes these specific things. In our Orthodox Church, St. Siloan tells us the joy of salvation is found and specifies how it is found. In that quote from his writings, he, he speaks about Father Cassian and what Father Cassian would say, but he said he's not sure of that, about Father Cassian's view that everyone outside the church is lost. He says, but what I know is that in the humility of Christ, 
there is hope, there is salvation. And the implication is that in humility, the humility of Christ, we find salvation in the Orthodox Church. If we do not possess the humility of Christ, we will not find salvation in our Orthodox Church. This does not imply that Silouan encourages us to find salvation in other places and in ways other than through the humility of Christ. St. Silouan is describing for us in his writings the door by which we must enter and what is the key by which to unlock the door. The door being the Orthodox Church and the key being humility, the humility of Christ. Through the door is found the grace of the Holy Spirit and all those things mentioned above. But they are not experienced aside from humility. One may be baptized in the Orthodox Church, and this may be analogous to, in a sense, arriving at a party. But if one lacks humility, it is as if the person at the party cannot eat the food, experience the joy of the festival, see the joy of the faces of other partygoers. Without humility, the grace of God is not known. The benefit of being in the church is lost. We all know how we enter into the Orthodox Church through baptism and by chrismation. The Holy Spirit abides in us. And when we sin and grieve the Holy Spirit, we lose the grace of the Holy Spirit. But when we truly repent of our sins, with such repentance, which such repentance is characterized as being a humble repentance, then the grace of the Holy Spirit returns. The humble and broken heart God will not despise the prophet and King David tells us in Psalm 50. Let us pause for a moment and be sure of what humility is, if it's such an important thing in the mind of St. Silouan. Does anyone have a definition for humility? How would you describe it? If someone says, that's a humble person, what would that person look like? How would they live? How would they act? Any suggestions? What's that? Lack of self. Yes, that's beautiful. That is very, that's very much the, the, um, the core of humility, because that's what Christ had. He set aside his glory as God and became a man. He, he lowered himself, he humbled himself, we say. He set aside that which is rightfully his, his power, his glory, and he became like us, humble. Compared to God, man is a rather humble thing. You had a suggestion? I was just saying put others first. Yeah, put others first, right? Not presumptuous, right? Differential to others. Self-aware. There's something I wrote. To be humble means to know who you are. To know your faults, to know your strengths. But you, you have to have that if you're humble. To be compassionate. Part of humility is having compassion because you know you have felt faults, right? And so you can be compassionate because you know other people have them too. You know you're, in a sense, got problems, so you can bear other people's problems. This is humility. Selfless love is another way to describe it. And lacking critical or judgmental spirit looking at other people's critically. This is a, a trait of humility. Does everyone have in your mind what humility is now? Or have an image of somebody that you can, can think of as humble? Stop me if, if, you, have, if you don't or you, if you have any questions. St. Silouan writes, the Lord loves man and his grace will be in the church until the day of judgment as it has been in times before. The Lord loves man, and though he created him from dust, he adorned him with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy, by the Holy Spirit we know the Lord, and in the Holy Spirit we love the Lord. But without the Holy Spirit, man is but sinful dust. 
The Lord instructs his children by the Holy Spirit and with his most pure body and blood and all and all who follow after the Lord are in the likeness of their Lord and Father. Therefore, brethren, with all your might preserve the peace of God, which is freely given to us. And when any man vexes us, if needs be, let us constrain ourselves to love him. And the Lord, seeing our pains, he will help us with his grace. St. Silouan here assures us of the presence of the grace of God in his church, even to the day of judgment, to the end of time. This grace does not depend, depart from the church, but it departs from men when they grieve the Holy Spirit by their sin. St. Silouan tells us what the result of the lack of the Holy Spirit is for man, that he is only sinful dust. Man was made from dust, but then God adorned him with the Holy Spirit, clothing man in divine glory. Being adorned with the Holy Spirit, man learns to love the Lord, to follow after the will of God. And we are instructed how we are to live by the Holy Spirit and by our communion with God, by our consuming the body and blood of Christ in the divine liturgy. The life of the Christian in St. Silouan's mind is intertwined with the life of the church. The church and the, the, in the church, the Holy Spirit is found. In the sacraments, the Holy Spirit lives. And, then, and this same Holy Spirit lives in us if we truly love the Lord. St. Silouan says, The more a man loves, the more ardently does he set his face towards God, yearning to be with the beloved Lord. And therefore will he approach the, the nearer to him while the man who loves but little will have but little desire for the Lord. And the man who does not love at all will neither wish nor aspire to see the Lord and will spend his life in darkness. Our free will to love or not to love is always present within us. By our choice to enter into the light of God or the darkness of sin, we repent of our sins and we experience the grace of God in some measure, but we sin again and lose the grace that we possessed. And so we repent again. The, the reason we lost grace was our sin. And we sinned because we did not remain loyal to God in all things. We presumed some strength which we did not have, or embraced some ungodly desire, and so we were led into sin. The root of our presumption or our giving in to the desire is that we had not acquired true humility, and therefore we have some pride within us. St. Siloan says, The Lord so loves man that he gives him the gift, gifts of the Holy Spirit, but until the soul learns to preserve grace, she is, in much, she is much tormented. The way man preserves grace is by learning to be humble, St. Silouan teaches us, like Christ was humble. It is in our pride that we lose grace, and this was St. Silouan's experience himself from which he speaks. He struggled with spiritual pride, and because of this pride, he was tormented. He writes about this, Whoever, like me, has lost grace, let him wrestle manfully with evil spirits. Know that you yourself are to blame. You fell into pride and vanity, and the Lord in his mercy is showing you what it means to be in the Holy Spirit and what it means to wage war against evil spirits. Thus the soul learns by experience the harm that comes from pride and so shuns vain glory and praises of man and evil thoughts. Then will the soul begin to recover her health and learn to preserve grace. St. Silouan teaches us the beginning of learning humility is in recognizing the root of the problem, which is our own pride, our own actions, our own decisions. In such recognition of our weakness and failures, we are able to have real repentance and forgiveness of our sins, and grace then will follow such repentance. To live continually in this humble state of repentance and recognition of our own weaknesses and failures preserves 
the grace within us. The Holy Spirit is able then to teach us, teach such a soul as this, and bring it a greater amount of His presence, His grace. St. Silouan, Silouan writes, I too want freedom and seek it day and night. I learned that freedom is with God and is given to, of God to humble hearts who have repented and sacrificed their wills before Him. To those who repent, the Lord gives His peace and the freedom to love Him. And there is nothing better in the world than to love God and one's fellow man. In this does the soul find rest and joy. And so, St. Silouan teaches us how to begin. If we find ourselves having never repented, or having repented before, but have walked away for a time from the life of repentance, and having lost the grace of the Holy Spirit, it is then to the church that St. Silouan calls us, and specifically to the pastors of the church, the bishops and priests that St. Silouan sends us to make our confession and seek remedies for our sins. St. Silouan writes now about the pastors of the church and their role in our humility, finding and learning humility and having repentance. He says, The Lord calls His bishops to feed His flock and gives them freely of the grace of the Holy Spirit, it is said that the Holy Spirit establishes the bishops in the church, and in the Holy Spirit they have the power to bind and to remit sins. And we are the sheep of the Lord's flock whom He loved unto the end, and to whom He gave our holy pastors. They are heirs to the apostles, and by the grace accorded to them they bring us to Christ. They teach us repentance. They teach us to keep the Lord's commandments. They proclaim the word of God, that we may know the Lord. They guide us along the path of salvation and help us to climb the heights of the lowly spirit of Christ. They gather the afflicted and straying sheep of Christ into the church's fold, that their souls may find rest in God. The pastors, they pray for God for us, that we may all be saved. As the friends of Christ, they are able to entreat and be heard of the Lord, attaining humility and the grace of the Holy Spirit for the living, forgiveness of sins for the dead, and for the church, peace and freedom from bondage. They carry the Holy Spirit within them, and through the Holy Spirit forgive us our sins. By the Holy Spirit they know the Lord, and like the angels they contemplate God. They are strong to tear our minds from the earth and to attach them to the Lord. They grieve when they see us grieving God, and preventing the Holy Spirit from dwelling in us. All the troubles of the earth lie on their shoulders, and their souls are carried away with love of God. They pray without ceasing, beseeching God comfort for us in our afflictions, and peace for the whole world. By their ardent prayers they draw us too to serve God in a spirit of humility and love. For their own humility and love for the people, the Lord loves them. Inasmuch as they continue in great toil and struggle, they are enriched by the wisdom of the saints, whose example they seek to follow in their own life. The Lord so loves us that He suffered on the cross for us, and His sufferings were so great that we are unable to apprehend them because we love the Lord so little. Likewise do our spiritual pastors suffer on our account, although we often do not see their sufferings. And the greater a pastor's love, the greater are his sufferings. And we who are his sheep should understand this and love and revere our pastors, St. Silouan says. In our Orthodox Church, St. Silouan is telling that us that we have recourse to a great source of help. The pastors of the church, the bishops and priests have been given by God the grace of the Holy Spirit to forgive our sins, to heal our spiritual illnesses, to aid us in our repentance, to teach and guide us in the way in which we should walk daily. It is the pastor's love for his flock, it is in the pastor's love for his flock that he will find his salvation, and it is in the people's obedience to their pastors that peace will come to the world. St. Silouan says, Brethren, let us dwell in obedience to our pastors, and then there will be peace in the world and the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, 
will abide with, uh, with us all, which is a remarkable statement that he says, that if we would just be obedient to the pastors of the church, peace would come upon the world. But we know we're not, because the world's not in peace, is it? We have work to do. But you may be thinking, I know my priest is not a saint. Far from it. He, and you can list off maybe your priest or your bishop's faults in your own mind. St. Silouan addresses your concern about the quality, in a sense, of your priest. He says, but perhaps you are thinking, how can this bishop or that spiritual father or priest possess the Holy Spirit when he is so fond of his food and has other faults? But I say to you, says St. Silouan, it is possible if he does not harbor evil thoughts, so that though there be some iniquity in him, it does not prevent grace from dwelling in his soul. In the same way as a tree and foliage may have some withered branches, but they do not harm the tree, but they do no harm and the tree bears fruit, or there may be tares in a field full of wheat, but they do not stop the wheat from growing. St. Siloan is here telling us how a priest who is imperfect, and some of whose sins his flock even is aware of, can still be a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit and a source of grace, healing and help to his flock. It is by the priest's avoidance of evil thoughts that he retains the grace of God, the grace of the Holy Spirit. But still yet you may object and say, my priest has evil thoughts, I bet, and does not live right, which I'm, I'm sure you don't know Father Anthony well enough to say that yet. <laughs> and I'm sure that's not true of him or Father Viren. You know Father Viren probably very well. St. Silwan has further advice, though, for you. And if your father confessor has not himself trodden the path of prayer, nevertheless seek counsel of him. And because of your humility, the Lord will have mercy on you and keep you from all wrong. But if you think to yourself, my confessor lacks experience and is occupied with vain things, I will be my own guide and will help, and with the help of books, your foot is set on a perilous path, and you are not far from being beguiled and going astray. St. Siloan reaffirms his advice to seek out the pastors, even ones who are poor examples, for it is in your own humility that such a poor pastor can still be a means of help. God is able to work through poor men if we approach with a humble prayer. It is also made clear that in what St. Siloan is saying about pastors that it is not by ourselves again that we find salvation. Again, it is in the church with those other members of the body of Christ that we are saved one helping another towards God. This is how God has willed it to be, that as the church humbly struggles towards God, we find salvation together. This image that St. Siloan is giving us is a communal image of life together with people in the church not separation. This is based on his experience, how he lived in the monastery, how he lived as a child growing up in the church. <coughs> he gives us the example of Christ's humility as the key to open the door of all the blessings in the church that are there. And this is what he is sure of. He's sure of the grace and the blessings of God in the Orthodox Church. And that's where his focus is, not on anything else. He doesn't want to speak on anything else because he doesn't know that. He doesn't know about this or that other thing, this religion, that religion, this denomination or that. He knows the Orthodox Church, and so that's what he speaks about. He says, in our Orthodox Church, this is what I know. This is what I'm sure of. Salvation is found this way, through seeking out God and humility. 
and seeking out God with others together, looking to your pastors for help, being an aid and a comfort to others, praying for those in need that God places upon your heart, humbling yourself and not raising up yourself with pride, thinking yourself better than others, but thinking of yourself as what you know you are. We're all dirt. We're all dirt. But dirt indwelled with the Holy Spirit. If we've been baptized and chrismated, if we've taken communion, and if we've humbly approached the chalice, then we retain some of that divine glory of God, some of that grace. And so no longer are we just dirt anymore. We're godly dirt. That's what St. Silouan says. We are become like God. We're approaching God. And that's what salvation is. Drawing closer to God. Knowing Him. Being clothed with divine glory, despite what we are. But we, it takes humility. It takes humility to do that. And it takes us together. And this is St. Silouan's message. So, if there's any questions, we take questions and comments or complaints even. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about that? What, he, what does he say, tell us to do? Well, all that that I said about pastors is part of that. Uh -huh. Being humble enough to go to your pastor and ask for advice. Even if you think maybe your pastor ain't so great. Which, you're blessed that that's not the, the case here. Because <laughs> you have several. You know, you have the pastor emeritus and you have the current pastor. Which is a blessing to have more than one priest around. You can go to them. And even if they weren't so great, if you had a little humility, God would speak through them. God would turn them into prophets, in a sense, for you, for your benefit, because you approached with the right spirit. So that's partly one way of cultivating humility, is, is by action, by going and asking for help. Um, prayer. Praying regularly cultivates humility. Having a consistent rule of prayer a time of prayer in your day, in the morning, in the evening. And it doesn't have to be extremely long. It just has to be consistent that you are willing to put aside your desires for even a few moments every day to focus and to, to speak to God. That cultivates humility. You know, to cultivate humility, just try and do things that don't make you prideful. Um, and in this day and age, there's a lot of things out there that try to puff us up and to tell us how great we are. Well, do the opposite. Do the opposite. Um, obedience is, is something that kind of Americans in general kind of get tense when you hear the word obedience. You know, you kind of get all tensed and stressed out. Like, I can't, you know, that's a bad word. But in the Orthodox Church, it's a wonderful word. Children to be obedient to their parents. Grown parents to, ha in a sense, still cultivate this sense of obedience for their elderly parents. And it might not, might not be that you, can, uh, you, ha you do exactly what your mother says. You know, you might be 50 and she might be, you know, 70. But there, in a sense, there's still respect for your, your, your parents, even at that age. Um, or even if your parents have passed, to, in a sense, be obedient to the things they taught you as opposed to just ignoring everything they told you. That's another way you, you can cultivate humility. Um, obedience at work. To work at your job as if to God. Not to your employer, but to, to work at your job as if God is the one who employs you, which he actually does. God is over all things, and so your employer is, in a sense, a steward even of his own company. He might not realize that. But if you realize that, then you do your job in obedience to God. And you cultivate humility that way, as opposed to thinking, you know, well, my, bo my boss has, you know, hasn't given me a raise in three years, so I'm not going to do my job as well. That's a prideful thought. 
if you do your job as obedience to Christ, then you, find, you can find humility. You can set aside your feelings of hurt or desires because of the workplace and do it unto God. And in so doing through that action, you cultivate humility. Children can do the same thing with their parents, high school kids. If they can learn to not trust in themselves completely, but to still listen to their parents and to at least incline their ear and consider it, you know, not just to blow it off right away, but you can start to cultivate a little humility. In teenage years, it's, you know, you're discovering yourself and you know, our whole environment in this country is about you know, living your life as if you're a teenager for your whole life. You know. So if you can learn to listen to all your parents and keep that, that, that practice of listening to others, then you cultivate humility. You know, again, being aware of your own faults and listening to others. You know, it might not be good advice, but if you recognize that this person is a human and that what they're saying, you know, you can give them the time of day, then you treat them res with respect, even if you're not going to do what they say because they might be dead wrong. Um, but if, as long as you, if you can even recognize their humanity and listen to them, give them respect, you're cultivating humility. It's when we blow people off that we're cultivating pride. Driving. Last, last way to cultivate humility. Driving, what a great place to cultivate humility. When they cut you off, to say, God bless you. You must be going to the hospital. Your wife must be pregnant. <laughs> to assume the best. Not to assume that they're just a jerk. You know, I'm, from, I'm from Southern California, so we get a lot more practice on freeway <laughs> driving and the chance to be humble there. But even here in Memphis, Memphis has horrible drivers. You know, but so to let them cut you off. Well, you don't have to get mad. This is their problem, whatever it is, you know, that's going on. Let it go. Another way, you know, to, to cultivate, you know, to, to pull back and let them get in. Even though you know that they've been on the, you know, driving on the right shoulder all the way up and they should have gotten in a mile ago or whatever. You know, but still, you know, it's better to let them in, not to get all upset push down the anger and the pride, and, you know, make space. So, many ways to cultivate humility. Not all of which is from St. Silwan in a sense, but those principles of obedience, self being self-aware, um, looking to the other, that's all through his writings. So, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I do understand what you're saying about the humility factor. That's very interesting. That to humble yourself enough to say to your priest, that that does posture you in a different way. But I I don't think that the Orthodox Church would look askance at somebody approaching God directly because I feel mm -hmm. that they believe what I think I see in the scriptures, which is that there are different Yes. So I, I understand you being a priest, and I like the idea that he can give you uh, ways of thinking about things that you haven't considered, or at, or if you can't, that the Holy Spirit will prop it up. Um, but I also think that there are times, maybe what my grandmother said is right, that particularly if you're just <clears throat> if you're not looking for advice, but you're more confessing your sin, <clears throat> that it wouldn't be inappropriate to speak directly to God. It's never inappropriate to confess your sins to God by yourself. It's good to do that all the time. After you know you've done something, Lord, forgive me. 
for what I just did. But then you also have to combine that with going before the priest. Because in, in the New Testament, in the very, very early on, confession was always public. It was before the whole community. You confessed your sins. You know? and, that was, and the church said, as time went on, in, in her wisdom, said, say it only to the priest. And if there are things that the priest um, sins that need a penance, then that's what, when it speaks about the priest binding and loosing, it's, there are certain sins that require a penance. You murder somebody, you commit adultery, um, fornication, blasphemy, heresy. You fall into heresy. You start walking around teaching things that aren't true. You, know, those, you, you have to go to the priest, especially for those things, and confess them. But even, you know, I, I've been getting in a fight with my, my uh, husband left and right, and it's just a big problem. It's good. Go to the priest. Confess it. And God assures us, he says, that the priest, if he loses that, God forgives it. God forgives it. That's the role of the priest and the bishop in the church, is to hear the sins. It's one of the things they're supposed to do. And it fell out of practice for a good number of centuries, regular confession, because the priests weren't educated under the... Um, under the Muslims. Priests weren't educated, so it was, there wasn't a confessor near you. And so the confessor would have to travel um, from, from place to place, and it wasn't a regular thing. But in this country, that's not so. All the priests, for the most part, are educated. They've all been to seminary, and they have a blessing often to hear confessions. And so that's you know, supposed to be a normal part of life, is to go make your, it's like going to the doctor and getting a checkup more so than it is going before a judge. It's a better way to think about it in medical analogy than as a juridical one. Like, I gotta go to the priest and he's really gonna give it to me. You know, I'm gonna have to fast for 40 days and because I did this and that, you know, that's not the point. It's more like, I got this disease called screaming at my kids. How do I get rid of the disease? Or having a bitter, bitter tongue with my spouse or being, you know, really negative about going to work. These things are illnesses, spiritual illnesses, rooted in pride. And so you go to the doctor, your physician, Father Anthony, and he can give you medicine in for it and to help deal with it. And, it, and having to do that builds, humi it cultivates humility because you have to go before somebody and admit that I really have this. I'm addicted. I'm addicted to being angry. People are. But you can break that addiction, you know. There's all kinds of addictions. We don't think of it. You know, you can be addicted to um, hostess cupcakes, you know, or to drugs. Ice cream. I heard ice cream, yes. You know, Lent is really good for breaking those kind of addictions, um, since we set aside things. But, you know, there's all, all kinds of things that we do that we don't realize are addictions. Or, or really bad habits that are really ingrained in us, ways of thought. And you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, I see this thing here. Did you know it was there? And you might say, no, I didn't realize, but now that you point it out, yeah, I do have a really bad attitude towards my mother, my father, my so-and-so. I didn't realize that. And then there's, there's ways of getting rid of those things. If we hold on to them, it's like they weigh us down. It makes it harder to approach God if we're filled up with all kinds of sinful habits. That's what confession is for, to root all that out. So, so I encourage you, yeah, go to your priest. You know, it's a humble thing. It's a, it's a humbling thing, and, that's a, and to think of that, that's a great thing, to learn some humility and to free yourself. This is what St. Silouan's saying, to be free, to really be free is to be humble because your conscience isn't attacking you anymore because of your sins. You've lowered yourself. You've, in a sense, opened yourself up before the priest and before God and let it all out. And he washes it away. And even if you start stacking it back up, you, you'll know more, you'll, it'll be more clear that, oh, look, look, I had this clean tablecloth here and now I'm starting to stack my sins back on top of it. You know, like dishes. 
And last time it got really full before I went to confession, but maybe this time I'm only going to, I'm not going to let it get, you know, a big stack of dishes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe it off right away. And this is what goes on. You keep your soul clean by going to confession regularly because it builds humility again. It helps wash everything out, bring everything to light, and then it can heal. It can heal. But if we don't, if we avoid the priest, then it's like we avoid the blessing. We avoid the blessing that's there. Same with the sacraments. If we avoid the sacraments, the same thing, confession is a sacrament, but communion as well, or, or unction. You know, or, or when you're sick, not calling the priest. You know, I got a really bad cold, Father. I've been in bed for three days. Go get the blessing. Get the blessing. The grace is there. Humbly ask for it, and God will bring it. God will bring it. That's, that's what St. Silouan is saying. So, does that make sense? Any other questions? Yes, Father. Father, I think most of us, when we begin to seek to live a life of humility, come upon the immediate pitfall of feeling pride in ourselves for setting out on the right path. Would you speak about the remedies for that? Oh, pride is the most devious of enemies within us because it takes different forms all the time. Um, even when you do something good, pride steps in and says, oh, you did that really well, and tries to puff you up. You know? Or if you've done something really bad, pride steps in and says, oh, you're so bad, God can't help you. That's pride. You're so bad, God can't help you to assume that you're, better th you're, you're more powerful than God because you've sinned so badly, that God is unable to help you in your sin. That's kind of the epitome of pride, is that kind of thought, which is rather scary. Um, and so, to, to learn how to deal with pride is really the cultivation of humility. The more you try to be humble and to seek help to do that and to practice things that help you be humble, the more you learn how prideful you are. And St. Silouan says, basically, that pride is the thing that he struggled with the most, and it was prideful thoughts. Uh, he, he had a monk say some, kind of puff him up when he was first in the monastery, and he struggled with it for 15 years. And it tormented him, this spiritual pride. But that's how he learned humility. The process of struggling with the pride was the thing, the road which t brought him to humility. And so it's, we sh when we see pride, we shouldn't get afraid of it, but we should kind of like plow right through it. See it, move on. That was a prideful thought. I'm not going to pay attention. I'm going to go down the path of humility and keep trying, keep trying. Um, the more we try, the more we learn about how pride tries to affect us. We become more familiar with what pride is, as we try to become more familiar with humility. Humility and pride are kind of like water and oil. They just completely are the opposite of one another. And so if you really become a, aware of humility, it's going to, in a sense, pull out all the pride and separate it and make it very clear. So in the beginning, it's good to ask advice often uh, because we can get really big ideas sometimes when we start the spiritual life. And you see this sometimes in converts. They have all this great zeal, and, all, and they're very loud and a lot of ideas, and, but they haven't been able to necessarily to recognize pride. And so they easily can try to start something they have no strength to continue. And it just goes away. And it becomes a discouragement. And so it's best to say, get, to, get, to ask advice. To get, a, get advice if some, some great thought comes to mind you know, about what you're doing in the spiritual life, about your prayer. You know, go, Father, Father, I've been really, you know, starting to, to pray, and I, f I really feel like I can pray the whole typicon of the church, you know, daily. That's not advisable, because you don't have the strength to do that yet, um, nor the manpower. You need a lot of people to kind of do all those services. You know, but the pride even though it's for a good thing, will try to deceive you into thinking you can do this spiritual thing. And so you go and you get the advice. You say, Father, 
You know, I want to start, you know, a, a, sh a homeless shelter. You know, I've, 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 I'm starting to pray, and I'm really, you know, I'm seeing this need, and I'm thinking, I feel called to start a homeless shelter. And again, that's a big task. Uh, but it might be pride. It might be pride trying to set you up for a big fall. And so you go, you get the advice. Father, I, I'm thinking this, and he would say, and say, you know what, maybe you should wait on that for a little bit. Don't start an organization, you know. Just try to say your prayers for like six months, and then come back and we can talk some more, you know. <laughs> So, advice, counsel, very important when you start. Um, and in, even in the years as you go by, the older you get, th th that doesn't mean you need counsel less, advice less. Um, but to always, in, a, you know, the, in the spiritual life, in the monastic uh, fathers, in their writings, they say, don't trust yourself. You know, whether it's the Ladder of Divine Ascent, which many of you heard of that book, it's read during Lent often. One of the chapters is on don't trust yourself. St. Dorotheus of Gaza, another writer, a uh, monastic father, he, again, he says don't trust yourself. Go to your confessor. Or as, you know, go to your spouse. You can use other people in the same way. Honey, I feel like God's calling me to buy this SUV. <laughs> All right? What does your spouse say, honey? I, we don't. They're, they're, the budget for that isn't there right now. You know, you don't fall into the pride that way. So getting advice is very important. Does that does that help, Father? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I don't know how much of a question this is, but uh, hearing you speak uh, about the, the writings, he mentions that uh, not to seek uh, out knowledge yourself in, in, in books instead of in lieu of going to a priest trying to find your own answers and that made me kind of think I know you said that the writings were intended for the Orthodox Church and not really a criticism of others but uh, it made me think what would St. Silouan have thought of televangelism televangelism he probably would not have liked TV <laughs> <laughs> at all because te television is a very self gratifying thing you know, you just kind of sit there and oh, watch. You know, it just washes over you the images. So you probably wouldn't like that. Um, and it depends on what they're saying. Would really be the you know, the thing. Saint Silvan's not a very condemning person in his writings. He talks about many places. He prays that all would be saved, that all would have the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Akathist for St. Silouan, the refrain of the, Akathist, of the Akathist is, Holy Father Silouan, um, it goes something like, Holy Father Silouan, in your great love, in your, in, your, in, your, in your great love for the world, you cultivated this in your prayer. This thing about in your, in your prayer, you had this great kind of like, un, not uncontroll or uncontrollable, but uncontainable love for the world, for the whole world. And so, his approach then is not to um, take one group and another group and pull them apart and dissect them and dis you know look at their theology and this and that or their you know their thought. It's it's he loves people. He loves the world and he wishes that all would know the Holy Spirit. And so he just and he so he prayed. He prayed. And I think that gives us kind of a model to follow. About we know where the grace is. We know how and how to find salvation, where to find it. Let's focus on that. God will take care of everything else. He'll take care of the televangelists. He'll take care of the, the this and the that and the, the who's and the what's it's and all that stuff. Um, but if we begin with ourselves and what, where, what we need to do humbly, then again, peace will come to the world, right? He says, if we could just be obedient to the pastors in general, you know, the church, if, the, if all, priests included, you know, if we could all, and the bishops themselves, if we could all kind of be obedient to the, the one shepherd, Christ himself, then there'd be peace in the world. But just because the church was obedient would bring peace to the world, he's saying. Not that everybody else is obedient. That's not what he's saying. He says, if we could just be obedient, 
then there would be peace. We could bring peace to the world. So if that's what it takes, then you know, well, that's what we have to start with ourselves. And that's humility. Looking and realizing, oh, I, I have to start with myself. The blame is right here. It's never out there. That's one of the things he really emphasizes. If we can stop looking out there for blame and looking only inside, then, because th that's what we can fix. We can work on what's in here. We can't work on what's in, in other people. We can't work on what's in our spouse, what's in our children necessarily, or the world. But right here, that's what we can work on. And so if we do, that has a good effect. It brings peace. So, is that, yes? So most things in life, the more you do it, the easier it gets. The older I get, in this faith, the harder it is. And just listening to you, you know, one of the things that has happened probably in the last, well, I guess in my lifetime, in the last 50 something years, is we've had a, an explosion of literature in, of the church and books to explain to us and how do you read and we go back and we say, oh well, the Yayas, they had, they didn't know. Oh, but they, they did. But they did know. In some so, sense, you know, they did, say, yeah. Well, they didn't have the books, but they knew. So now we have all these books, and, you know, I watch, even in my house, we've got lots of books, lots of books that some have never been opened, mm -hmm. probably for the good. Yeah. But, so how do you, how do you, because, you know, here in, in the States, like, let's read now. We've got Kindle. We've got all this stuff. We're constantly, you know, looking, but we're not... Getting very far, are we? We're not getting too far. Kind of, we're going backwards. Yeah, so what the Yaya's kind of had something in there. They had life. They had the village church. Or even in the city, they had you know, the church around the corners where they went. And even though if their priest was illiterate, again, they had the church, they had the services. The grace was there. If they were humble, they tapped into it, and they were taught. Since Ilawan was illiterate almost, he was humble. He had a humility, and God himself, that's what he says, the Holy Spirit has taught me. All the things he writes, he always says, the Holy Spirit taught me these things. He wasn't educated, but he was humble. And he tapped into the church. He went to his confessor. He, he, he was involved in the sacraments, going to communion, going to confession, and the monks confess all the time. They confess their thoughts, every thought they have. Um, it's not necessarily advisable in a parish, you know, to every day go to your priest and want to confess your thoughts. You would kill your priest. You know, don't do that. So that's not what we're going for. But he was very much intertwined in the life of the church, in the feasts, in the cycle of festivals of the church. And this is how, our, you know, the yayas were. They, would, they were the ones sweeping and cleaning up, getting ready for, you know, theophany or for annunciation or putting the flowers around the icons, baking the bread, bringing their offering. I, there's this wonderful book called The Waters of Mara that's written by an Anglican priest who went to Greece in the 50s, right after World War II. And he goes into the northern part, the Macedonian diocese, I think it's called, the western Macedonian diocese, so it's not eastern Macedonia, I guess. Um, and just talks about life. What's it like there? And what do the churches look like? And he's talking about, you know, the bells are ringing. The, the, there's no bulletins. No one knows what, you know, there's not like 9 o'clock is when church starts. But on Sunday, you know, the bells, you know, the sun comes up. The priests and the, the chanters are at church. Midnight office is being prayed. Um, and then Orthros, <laughs> you know, nobody, not many people are there. Unless those, you know, but, and then the women are coming in because they bake their bread on Saturday night for the whole week, and they bring a loaf, and they bring names, and they bring some wine, and they bring, you know, an offering to God with the names of the people they're concerned about. And this is the rhythm of their life. And they're in the church, and that's where they live. It's like just intertwined into their life. That's, the, that's life. Life in Christ is life in the church. The feasts, be, you know, listening to the hymnody. That's, that's your, th your seminary, is, is going to Orthros and listening, because that's where a lot of the hymnody that teaches us is. 
about the saints, about the festivals, about what's going on. It's so rich to just listen to that. And that's where you get trained. That's, what they, that's how they were trained, in a sense. Um, and so the books are good. If they're good books, there's a lot of bad books out there. You know? So again, you ask, is this a good book to someone who might know? Humbly, you think, okay, Father, I'm, I'm struggling with this thing. Do you have a book or a chapter or something that might help me? Then God's grace sees that and gives you what you need. You know, when we go out and say, ooh, I like that. That looks interesting. That kind of sparks my fancy. There's, a, there's our own desire there, our own passion for something. You know? And it might not be what you need. And so, again, to get the advice. But to be entwined in the life of the church, like they were in the, you know, this, this book, you know, it talks about being in, in, the, in the church in the 50s and Greece, and you're, you're in this village, and it's demolished, and the first thing you build is the church, and the second thing you build is the school. And you're, you know, you got a tarp over your house or something. You know, that's how they lived. And they just built, rebuilt their lives. But it was always around the church. Life in the church. The kids are in the church, you know. And um, there's a nice, a very nice book that was just published that kind of gives you this image that, um, called the, Greece, the Greek, Greece's Dostoevsky, um, about a man um, named uh, Alexis uh, Pap Papadiamantis is his name. He lived around the same time St. Silouan did, he, but he was a writer. He wrote no short stories and novels, but they're all about life in the church, and these things are now getting translated into English. And this, the book that's out called Greece's Dostoevsky is about his writings and about the theology that's in them. And it's about, you know, the priests and how they're portrayed in the stories and the people and how they're portrayed in the stories and what does that all mean? And this is what he's talking about, how the people live how they live in the church, um, and what the church is like in their life on, this, on the island of uh, Skiathos. Um, and going off to the little chapels out in the countryside for the feast days for those chapels, and that this is the rhythm of their life. They fill it with God, and the worship of the saints and God, the veneration of the saints, the mother of God, these things. And this is what, they kind of revolve everything around. Not soccer and school and work and, you know. We kind of have to get our head on straight humbly, and, not, and learn it's not about money, not about positions or pride or all these things, how nice of a house I have. It's about the grace of God dwelling within us, which brings peace. And if we get oriented right, and we learn where to go and find that in the life of the church, which is lived in the house as well, having a place in the house with icons where you pray regularly, you have to do that if you're going to come here and pray and get a benefit. It both have to go together, being at home, you know, like, like she was saying about confessing her sins to God directly, you know, that's a humble life. Daily, stopping in the evening and saying, Lord, I failed in these ways, and saying prayers, you know, prayers in the evening, and then coming here, you know, going to confession, um, being here for the feast and the, you know, the liturgical life, being here for the, you know, the, even the festival, you know. It's a moneymaker for the church, but still, it's life in the church. You're working together for something greater than yourself. It's all there. So we just have to get our mind, you know, it's like we just have to look at it right and, you know, start getting ourselves straight so we can walk right and make some progress and re recognize I, I don't have to reach out for, you know, success in the world over here or money over there. I don't have to reach so far for those things. I just have to be diligent, be obedient. To God and what he's given me right now and it'll work out and then you know I'll get the book when I need it you know but I'll get the advice the life in the church will will give me what I need it'll tell me about the book so It came to you. Was Liturgy was right there. Going on. So anyway, that was just interesting. And the other thing is about getting your head off straight. And this is just a little anecdote that I think is funny in light of what you were saying about confession and humility. And I mean, this is an example of somebody who didn't have her head off straight, but was trying. But 
first time I went to communion, I was, I mean, to confession, I was 24. I'd been married a year. I grew up in a generation where we didn't go to confession. It was just out of favor for a long period of time. Yeah. So I go, we were living in Washington, and uh, I go and go up to the Soleil. I had never done this before. I didn't know what I was doing. The priest told me to get down on my knees, and I did, and then start bawling about how I had been so ugly about Harry's mother for a year, my mother-in-law, and boo-hoo, and forgive me, and whatever. And I was sincere. But then I got up, and the priest gave me his hand, and I shook it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was all mixed up what I was doing. There was humility, but there wasn't humility, and I was angry. Yes. We're, we're always a mix, often. It's the, 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 spirit, the fathers of the church describe life as kind of like a process. There's these stages to it. It's like you, you, get, you purify yourself, meaning you, you start to you work on how you're living. And as you do that, you learn God, God enlightens you. So you start to, you know, you kind of move on to the next step of you've kind of, you're living right. Now you're kind of understanding right. And then the next step is, you're seeing God. You're interacting with God in this life. But, in, but they're not really three stages. They're kind of all together. But in some sense, it's easy to pull those apart to kind of talk about them and how they work and things. But we're always trying to live right, and we're always, God is always kind of illumining our mind, teaching us by the Holy Spirit. And in little ways, we start to see God and experience God. And that always is supposed to grow, as St. Paul says, from grace to grace, from faith to faith, from a little bit of faith, a little bit of grace, to a whole bunch, to a lot. And in a sense, the, the person expands inside. The heart, in a sense, grows to encompass the presence of God more fully, continually, even in the life to come. In a sense, the, we expand internally where God dwells within us in a greater way. This is the, or, the life of the Orthodox Christian. Now, and then in the kingdom to come. It won't be boring. It will be continually, continually growing. But it's always a mix of a little good and some bad, often. And we're always trying to, in a sense, pull the bad out of the good. Even in our good deeds, sometimes there's bad in them. And humbly, if we have some humility, we try to do something right, we see how we do it wrong, and the next time we do it a little better, and we see a little more how we've done it wrong, and then a little more. And it's like you said, life seems to get harder and harder. You know, St. Siloan was saying, says that, you know, the, as you go along, it's the more, and all the fathers kind of talk about this, the closer they get to God, the more they recognize how horrible they are. And they keep humble. Because if we, if we started thinking like, oh, I'm really making a lot of progress here, Pride would trip us up and we'd fall off that ladder of divine ascent. We get easily tripped up by the demons. But because we continually see what we really are in a deeper way and we experience life more fully and thus it, we experience the struggle more, it means that uh, we're changing. We're changing. We're able to bear more now as we get older and more mature spiritually. The cross can be heavier. Uh, we can bear it because we've made progress. But we still feel that weight, and it keeps us humble. It keeps us humble. And in many ways, that's a blessing. Otherwise, you know, we would we'd lose our focus. Lose our focus. You know, so St. Siloan, he did, end of his life, he wasn't sinning at all. He was, you know, communing with God continually, and he would weep for his sins. <sighs> he had tears every, you know, you know, when he would pray because of his sins, of the past, not the ones that he's committing because he wasn't sinning. Even in his thoughts were pure. But he still had humility. It's like it, it got more, greater and greater and his repentance got greater and greater. So, yeah. So it's, as my boss tells me, Father, Father John Mashburn, the, the senior pastor at St. John's, he, he quotes, I don't know what father it is that says this, but he says, it's blood till the end. <laughs> the battle is it's just bloody to the end. You know, it's a battle to the end. That's okay, though. It's like in Great Compline, we sing, God is with us. 
but God is with us. Understand all ye nations, for God is with us. So we have to keep, we keep going. We keep humble because God is with us. And we see how hard, you know, what we really are. So any other questions? Thank you. This is an icon of St. Siloan and his disciple, Elder Sophroni. I'll have it up here if you want to come see it. Um, and then also I have his, the book itself if you wanted to look at it. So you'll just be sitting up here. Thank you.